Good morning, everyone. How are we doing out there? Is anyone awake? There we go. There's one person. <laughs> all right, let's all go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just come before you this morning, Lord, just um, so thankful for another beautiful day, Lord, and the opportunity to just gather together, God, and with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and just to um, <clears throat> just come before your throne, God, and to sit at your feet, Lord. And I pray, Lord, right now that we would just, um, that you would empty us of ourselves, God, that you would come and fill our hearts, fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and speak to us, God, and that we wouldn't leave here the same as we came, Lord. And I pray, Heavenly Father, just for, um, for your hand, Lord, to move in this community and in this country, Lord. And, and with everything going on, God, the world needs a light. The world needs you, God. And I pray, Lord, that even now you would just change our hearts, God, and help us to be more like you, God, in, in love and patience and all the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. Even though we fail, God, every day, you give us a new chance, God, and, and you're the God of second chances, you're the God who never changes, and you're always faithful, God, and faithful to forgive us and, and to love us, and we just thank you for your promises, Lord. Help us to be a light in this world, Lord God, and speak to our hearts today, we pray, in Jesus' name.
We're in Galatians chapter 5 this morning. Galatians chapter 5. If you want to turn there, Galatians chapter 5. This morning we are going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And the title of my message is Marks of a Fruitful Life. Marks of a Fruitful Life. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much, Lord, for your love and your grace and your mercy. We ask, Lord, that you continue just to have your hand upon our services, Lord God, as we meet out here, Lord God, at the park. And we just pray, Lord, that you continue to give us opportunities to uh, allow our faith to shine, Lord God. We thank you for uh, the tremendous showing on Thursday for the human trafficking awareness, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all that came out and honked the horns, drove by, wore blue, uh, held signs. We just thank you for that opportunity, Lord. And we do pray for the 800,000 plus kids right now that are under the the guise and the, the burden, the bondage of human trafficking, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that there would be deliverance for them. We pray for those organizations, Lord, that are working to free these kids, Lord God. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you continue just to um, have your hand upon our church right now, Lord God, as we meet. And some of us here, Lord, have lost jobs, Lord God. We just pray for your provision. Some of us here, Lord God, have been affected in, maybe in an indirect way or a direct way with this virus, Lord God. And we just pray that you just have your hand upon our families, Lord God. Just set a hedge about us, Lord, and we just pray for those that have been affected by the, the virus, Lord God, uh, family and uh, loved ones, Lord God. We just pray that you just have your hand upon them and bring a speedy recovery, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you for your love and your grace and your mercy and just Inhabit the praises of your people now, Lord God, and may you just author our thoughts. We thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. You will recognize them by their fruits. There's something that identifies you as a Christian. There is something that causes you to stand apart from those who don't know Christ as a Christian. There are many people that maybe have an indirect concept of what God will accept into heaven or, or what God uh, allows or they have their own philosophy. And, and that's the very mindset that Paul is up against in the book of Galatians in speaking with regard to the Judaizers and their attempt to try to steer people away from faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so they're saying that it's not enough just to believe in Jesus Christ, that you must become a Jew, you must be circumcised, you must obey the law of God. And so... Paul says if you go about that route, eventually the works of the flesh will be made known. And they're very evident what the works of the flesh are. It's a very difficult life to try to bring about transformation by ministering to the outward. God's transformation takes place on the inward, in the spirit of man, God moves mightily by going to the heart of the problem, which is the heart. There are those that will do certain works and they'll abide by certain regulations of certain faiths or religious organizations. They'll have a religious walk, but Little do they know that God requires perfection. And in our own attempt for righteousness, there is no way that we could come close to
to the righteousness that is required for heaven, which is perfection. And so there are a lot of people that will do certain works. And Jesus goes on to say, there will be people that say, Lord, Lord, and, and they want to enter. But not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. There's going to be people that say, I did all these works in your name. I have done all these works, all these good things. I have changed people's lives, but there was no relationship with Christ. And Jesus in Matthew 7 says, to those who say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your ways, did, did, did mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. There's something that identifies you as a Christian this morning. And Paul is going to go over the characteristics or the mark of a fruitful life, which is the title of our message this morning. The marks of a fruitful life. Now, I love mangoes, and I love when they're grown right, man, mangoes, strawberries. Oh, brother, I just love fruit. I love, yesterday I had some good pineapple, and man, the sweetness of the fruit was, man, it was just out of this world. Summer fruits, man. You know that there was great care and concern when, when this fruit was being grown in order to bring about its fruit, it, its, uh, its sweetness, and and even its luster, the way the fruit looks, there's pruning that had to take place of that vine or that tree in order to bring about healthy fruit. And sometimes pruning takes place in our lives in order to bring about healthy fruit in our lives. Now, the first thing that Paul speaks about is the foundation of living in the Spirit. What's the foundation of living in the Spirit? In verse 16 it says, I say then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he says in verse, 15, verse 25, he says this, If we live in the Spirit, first it's walk in the Spirit in verse 16, now it's live in the Spirit. Let us also walk in the Spirit. Now in order to have a fruit-filled life, in Jesus, Jesus says, I must bear fruit that lasts. I must bear fruit that will remain. What kind of fruit does Jesus have in mind? Well, Jesus said, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. We prove that we're disciples of Christ by the amount of fruit that we bear. If you keep my commandments, he says, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now remember last week in contrast to the fruit of the Spirit, we see the works of the flesh. We saw this last week. We saw how a godly life is nurtured apart from the works of the flesh. Now Paul says the important thing for us is to live by the Spirit in verses 16 through and 25. And then he says in verse 18, he says it's important not only to live by the Spirit, but be led by the Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, to direct us. In John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide us into all truth. And then in verse 25, he says basically to stay in sync with the Holy Spirit. To stay in sync with with the Holy Spirit is to stay in sync with God's life, to stay in sync with God's plan for our lives. Now, if we think about it, a strong spirit-filled life is the result of basically what? Saying yes to the things of the Spirit. God will call you, God will call upon you, especially in difficult times like this. He'll say, it's better for you to stay home. Stay home, be safe. Okay. It's better for you not to worship. Right? That's what the world will say. It's better for you not to worship. It's, it, 
Church is not essential, according to our governor. But the Spirit of God says, church is essential. My life in Christ is of the utmost importance. It's of the utmost importance that I stand for the Lord. That's keeping in sync with the Holy Spirit. And it means saying yes to the desires of the Spirit. It also means saying yes to the Spirit needs to become a daily routine in our lives. Walking in the Spirit means that yielding to the Spirit is a daily routine. It's something that you continue to do every day as you seek the Lord. You open His Word. You seek to pray for your children, pray over your children. The other day, I, I make it a point to lay hands on my boys before they go to sleep. And, and uh, one night, they were so tired, and, and they, we were all tired, and I put them to bed. And, and as I was walking out of the room, all of a sudden, Nehemiah says, hey, wait. And he said, hey, wait, because he wanted me to lay hands on him and pray for him. And so I went over there and laid hands on him and prayed with him. That's walking in the Spirit. That's making your life in Christ a daily routine. Is just praying over your kids, praying over your family, seeking the Word, seeking to live out the Word in your life. We need to say yes to the spiritual needs in our life. But I think one of the things that God is calling us to do this morning is to take an honest inventory of our spiritual life. An honest inventory of our spiritual life. Am I bearing fruit today? Am I bearing fruit? If people looked at my life and they walked into my house and they saw me interacting with my kids or with my wife, would they say that Christ lives here? If somebody walked into your house would they say Christ lives here? There's something different about this house. And I'm not talking about just posting scripture all over the place. I'm not talking about posting a scripture on the outside of your door or, or anything like that. I'm talking about real down home Christianity. Like you, you welcome people and you have the gift of hospitality and and you're just like ministering to people when they come in. You talk about the Lord freely and how the Lord has blessed you. And, and not, not in a, a freakish way, but in a, in, a, in a way that you seek to minister. Because a lot of times I, I think that we can kind of overdo it. But you know what? I think it's important for the Lord to lead us into certain conversations about the Lord. He will do that. He'll speak to your heart and he'll say, you know what, I want you to minister to your neighbor who's in your house right now. And then the Lord leads you to ask, not, not to start berating him with scripture, but to s just simply ask him, how are you doing today? How's everything going? How's your family? And maybe even say this, you know what, we always pray for your family. We're thankful for you. Man, that, that right there, we always pray for you and we're thankful for your family. Man, that, that does amazing things. That, that's opened so many doors for us, my family. But Paul says in Galatians that we need to walk in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit won't gratify the flesh. He says, so I say then, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That is the flesh. The sinful nature. The, the way of the world. That is the flesh. Walking in the Spirit will also oppose the flesh. He says in, in verse 17, For the sinful nature of the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that they do not do, so that you do not do what you want. Now remember, there's a battle going on. Constantly there's a battle going on. There's a battle not to pray and to pray. There's a battle not to read your word and to read your word. There's a battle to come to church and not to come to church. And I think even more so now, I think there's a great passivity in the church because of the ability to watch online and the availability of church services online. I think there's a passivity 
in the urgency to come together as a church. It's so important. We thrive doing what we're doing right now, gathering together. This is our gathering. This is our opportunity to come together and to rejoice together in the Lord and to battle together and to lift each other's arms up. But remember to say yes to the desires of the Spirit and no to the desires of the flesh is a constant struggle, according to Romans chapter 7. Last week we read, remember, doing the works of the flesh. Remember, is doing what comes naturally if you give into the flesh. If you give into the worldly appetite, it comes natural. Today we see Paul sharing that bearing the fruit of the Spirit is doing what comes naturally if you're given to the Spirit, which is marked by obedience. Walk. He says, that is a command. Walk is to live in the present tense. It should be a constant way of life. And the question is, a test to see if you're walking in the Spirit is when you sin, does it bother you? Does it bother you? Do you feel uncomfortable when you sin? Or do you say, well, it's my life. I'll do what I want. If you're concerned about your sin, it shows that the Spirit is at work in your heart. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature. You look at what the Bible says here. It says in verse 16, I say then walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He's speaking now. He's, he's coming into that section that we're going to look at this morning with regard to walking in the Spirit. He says for the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery fornication uncleanness lewdness idolatry sorcery that is drug abuse hatred contentions jealousies outbursts of wrath selfish ambitions, dissensions or divisions, heresies, right? Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries or wild parties, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Here we pick up in verse 22. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, the context here is these works of the flesh are going to be evident if you're trying to perfect yourself in the flesh. You're going to realize that you can't bring about that transformed life, that those matters of the heart will eventually be seen on the outside. Those things like murders and, and those lewdness and, and you, all those things will come to the surface because you're seeking to make, be, be made perfect in the flesh. But Paul says, instead of trying to fight off the flesh also, he said, yield to the Spirit. Yield to the things of God. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Yield to His Word. He says, you who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I love that. In the big picture... The Spirit has one work to do. We see the works of the flesh, the plural, but we see the fruit of the Spirit as one. This is the big picture. The Spirit has one work to do in all of us. These aren't the gifts of the Holy Spirit which are distributed and individually based by the will of the Spirit. This is something for every Christian. This is something that identifies the life of every Christian here. Now, what are these things? What is the character of the Spirit-filled life? We saw the foundation, which is being led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, but there's also a character of the Spirit-filled life. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul starts off with love. I love this. Not just because it's love. I love it. Because love in encapsulates everything else love is what should drive the rest of the fruit paul starts off with love because it holds all the others together 
Love is supreme. It's a supreme virtue of the Christian life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, many of you know this. You have it plastered behind the toilet or on the refrigerator. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at this. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Just noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love. If I don't love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned as a martyr, but if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Love should always be the motive of our life. Everything we do, we worship because of the love that's been poured out into our hearts. We provide for our families. We minister to our families. We are hard workers because we're driven by the love that we have for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We minister to each other. We give to each other because of the love that drives us, that moves us, that motivates us. Paul the Apostle said it best in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says it's the love of Christ which compels me. I love that. And this is no different. He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. Now, you would look at this scripture and you would say, these are all beautiful adjectives of what, or descriptors of what love is. But actually, in the Greek language, this whole verse is tattered with verbs. These are all verb tenses. Why? Because the love that Paul the Apostle is speaking of in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a love of action, a love that is sacrificial, a love that is other-centered. That is agape love. That is the love that Paul is outlining here. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Faith expressing itself through love. How do you live your life of faith? By through the expression and the outpouring and the outliving of love in your life. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. Notice the action in this. That someone laid down his life for his friends. I love that. Look at the action in that. He laid down his life. Sometime back, someone did a survey and found that 40% of Americans said they believe in love at first sight. They fall in love with somebody and, oh man, she's the... She's the best one for me, or he's the best one for me, and they love at first sight. I remember the first day my wife actually did trip into my life, and uh, I remember the first time I saw her, I thought, you know what, this is love, but it grew from there. It was much more than just something physical or on the outside or something that I could see with my eyes. I began to fall in love with her life for the Lord. Love is much more than just emotion. It's not just emotion. The kind of love that Jesus speaks of goes way beyond emotion. His kind of love is an action. He talks about laying his life down for our lives. Thomas Kempis says this. He says, whoever loves much does much. Whoever loves much does much. We have social distancing going on right now, which is uh, a little controversial. We have the mask mandate. That is a little, right, mandate. You can't go shopping without one. You can't go, you can't, some drive-thrus, they they make you put it on when you go through. 
There was a McDonald's drive through that I went. I'm sorry for saying McDonald's, but I'm out it now, so well. But I went to a McDonald's, and they said, I can't, they, the lady in the speaker sa- said, I can't serve you unless you have your mask on. I said, you're behind a speaker. Yeah, well, that's the rule. And she said, I can't serve you unless you put your mask on. So it's getting a little much. It's getting a little much. And we got to really pray for our nation. But there's still a way to love one another, even through this time of social distancing. We could call one another. We could call our neighbor. We could leave our garage door open for a little while and stand outside and wave to our neighbors and say, hi, how are you? Hope everything is good. I'm praying for you. And reach out and just let people see the love of Christ in and through you. I think it's important that we call people, that we call people maybe that we haven't seen in a while. Check in with them. And You have their phone numbers? There's just so much that, that I, myself, and our staff can do. We don't have a formal membership here, so we don't have a, a directory of, of members here. So some of you have gotten together with other people, other, other brothers and sisters in the church throughout the years of us meeting, and, and you have their con- call them up and find out how they're doing. Nobody really writes letters too much anymore. Maybe you could send a card, write a little note, and say, I'm thinking about you. Maybe some scripture, maybe a gift card. Let people know that you love them. You know, it could be a $5 little Starbucks card or something. And just blow people away that way. But that's love working. Now joy, he speaks about joy. The Greek word for joy is kara. This uh, noun describes a feeling of inner gladness. It doesn't depend on your outward circumstances. This inner gladness, this delight, this rejoicing, it's a depth of assurance, it's confidence, and it ignites a cheerful heart, and in turn, that cheerful heart leads to a cheerful behavior. It's the the foundation of joy, if you think about it, is God. Everything that he's done for us, the hope that he's provided for us, the fact that he sent his only begotten son to the cross to die for us. He took our place in the cross because we could not pay the debt For heaven, we could not pay the debt of sin. There had to be a perfect sacrifice. Jesus himself became that perfect sacrifice. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He took our place on the cross. And now anyone who calls upon him and believes that he is risen from the dead can and will be saved. There is great joy that comes from that. There's joy that comes to my heart knowing that I'm going to be in heaven, knowing that I'm called upon Jesus Christ, knowing that I have a place that's prepared for me, knowing that, that there's a place prepared for every single one of us here that calls upon the name of the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit, as we know, is what happens when the Spirit dwells in the believer, in you and me. And to have the Holy Spirit within us fills us with an inexpressible, glorious, I love what 1 Peter says, glorious joy. It's an illuminous, it's a joy that stands out. The scriptures are a testament to the generation of God people, God's people, who have been commanded by the Lord to rejoice. He says, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Isn't there a song that says that, Michelle? Song of rejoice? I won't have you come up here and sing it for us, so. But I think there's a song that says that, rejoice. I forget the, the song, how it goes. But uh, Nehemiah, man, was one of the, I love the book of Nehemiah. When you get a chance, it's not a very big book. But dive into the book of Nehemiah. It'll literally, if you read it from beginning to end, it'll take you an hour maybe. But you read the book of Nehemiah, and you'll be blown away. Eleven times you see him praying. And remember Sambalat and Tobiah come against him, and 
and, and all the people that are with him, and he's building the, the walls of Jerusalem. He's building the, the walls, and they're coming against him. They're, they're trying to tell him, hey, there's a mandate that says that you can't build, right? Remember that? And where did this come from, right? And we see them coming against Nehemiah and the men, and what does Nehemiah say? Nehemiah says, okay, you know what? God's called us to build and defend, so he builds with a trowel. Everybody put a trowel in your hand and a sword in the other hand. So they were building and defending at the same time. And what does he say? He says, he says this. He told the Israelites that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. I love that. The joy of the Lord would be their strength in Nehemiah 8.10. What is your strength today in the midst of this pandemic and, and unrest and in many people's minds, uncertainty. And, and I, I feel that we have, as Christians, we have certainty in Christ. There's no doubt. But we have joy. It doesn't depend on our circumstances. Happiness depends on your circumstances. Your bank accounts are filled. Oh, I'm happy. Our bank accounts are empty. Oh, I'm not happy. You know, and, and, and what happens on the outside indicates whether we're happy or not. But with joy, it doesn't matter what's happening around us. Our joy is constant. Our joy remains. Our joy is constant. Now, another word that Paul uses is peace. That word in the Greek is erina. So, kara for joy and erina. It's interesting in Paul's days that uh, kara and Irene were common names in Paul's day. Now, the great word for peace is Irina. Now, in, in this verse, it means more than just living a life with no conflict or being quiet or still or at rest. Having this kind of peace means having tranquility in your heart that originates from understanding that your life is truly in the hands of a loving God. It means experiencing a quiet inner self despite opposition, or stress. Now, we can't misunderstand this word. We have to understand that having peace doesn't mean that you will not have conflict, you will not have stress, and you will not have difficult times. And I think you realize that when you came to the Lord, when you asked Christ in your heart, that all your problems didn't just miraculously disappear. Now, God transformed your life. He transformed your desires. And he's filled your life with peace and strength and joy. But the conflict still remains. Remember, there's still a battle that ensues. As long as we're in this body of flesh, we're going to experience opposition, conflict. We're going to experience the enemy, Satan, trying to discourage us, trying to depress us, trying to get us to fall back into our sinful lifestyle, trying to do things that are against God's desire for our lives. We're going to encounter that battle. It's something that happens in our lives on a constant basis. But Paul in, in Philippians, I think he said it best in Philippians 4.11. He said, I learned to be content in whatever, whatever the circumstances. And he wrote those words, to be content in whatever state I am or whatever circumstances. He wrote those words from prison. He wrote those words from prison. When the fruit of peace is produced within by the Holy Spirit, we could live life to the fullest in harmony and tranquility in spite of our circumstances. We learn to depend on the Holy Spirit and understand that He will be with us in every situation. We'll have rest rather than anxiety. Rest rather than anxiety. Now, Paul the Apostle in Ephesians chapter 2 said it best. He said, Christ is our peace. Christ is our peace, and it's so true. The peace that we experience in our lives, Jesus said, my peace, my peace I give to you. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It's the peace in Him that we experience. 
According to Ephesians, Jesus is our peace. I love that. Sometimes we could get caught up in seeking peace for ourselves, that we create discord with others, where, or we isolate ourselves from the problem by moving out of the city to a peaceful cabin in the woods, for instance, but uh, so that we could kind of pretend like it doesn't exist or pretend like everything's going away. I think we realize that whenever we go to a retreat, it seems like, man, the Lord is speaking to me, the Lord is speaking to me, but we always encourage people, be ready, have your guard up, have your armor on, because the minute you go down that mountain, you know what? You're going you're gonna to be met with the ploys, the attempts of the enemy to discourage you. Remember, after the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, they saw Jesus in all his glory. His glory was unveiled for a time. They came down the mountain, Mount Hebron, or Mount Hermon, I'm sorry, Mount Hermon. They came down the mountain, right? And at the bottom of the mountain, who was meeting them? Who was with them? A demon-possessed man. You could go up to the mountains, but the enemy is always going to be there to try to discourage you. We can't pretend that conflict doesn't exist. Conflict avoidant isn't, avoidance isn't peace. We lean into the Lord. We yield to the Lord. And we trust in the Lord. We have faith in Him. And that faith brings peace. He speaks about patience. In other, in other translations, it speaks of long-suffering, right? And this speaks of patience with people. How many of you need patience with people? <laughs> patience with people. Long-suffering. Amen to that. Long-suffering, right? They call it long-suffering for a reason, right? Sometimes we suffer long in being patient with people, but love suffers long, is patient with people, not quickly irritated. God is patient with us. We think about, we turn the table a little bit, and we think about God's patience towards us. We know we're not perfect. We know we're not sin sinless. We know we mess up. And despite our failures, despite our trip-ups, God is patient with us. He is long-suffering with us. He's abounding in mercy and grace. This patience means being not quickly irritated. So this patient doesn't mean, patience doesn't mean waiting for future gain either. When we're injured or hurt by others, it's, I think also we could be quick to vindicate ourselves. But this word means to not faint in times of trial, to be long-suffering, to be patient. I've heard it said so many times, I need to be more patient. God, God I, I need to pray for more patience. When all we, God has called us to do here, according to Galatians chapter 5, is to lean into the Spirit, to lean into God, and the fruit is something that comes naturally through yielding your life to the Spirit of God. It's something that comes naturally. If you yield to the flesh, you're going to reap the things of the flesh. But if you yield to the Spirit, the Bible says, it's life and what? Peace. Job said it best. He said, though he slay me, I will trust in him. Though the Lord allows difficult situations to come to my life that seem to be unbearable, though he slay me, I will continue to trust in him. Because I know God is my Savior. He is my Redeemer. The patience of Job was merely an outward display of the faith of Job. The hope of Job and the love of Job. Notice faith, hope, and love are the triad of virtues. We see that all through the Word of God. Now he speaks about kindness. The word for kind is krestos. It means to be useful. It's a biblical kindness. It involves some kind of action. We're told to love not in word, but in deed and truth. That is kindness. It is living out your Christianity. It is following through and demonstrating our, our capacity for love. And get this. The greatest way, listen up. The greatest way 
For kindness to be made evident is through forgiveness. How many of you have somebody that you need to forgive in your life? Forgiveness is evidence through kindness. We see it often. There are people that wronged us. There are people that hurt us. But we're told that love is not in word, but in deed and truth. God has called us to follow through. He's called us to demonstrate our capacity for love and forgiveness in these things that we do every day. So important. It's not enough just to wait for the opportunity to show kindness. When the opportunity is not there and you pray, Lord, how can I show your life? How can I show my love? How can I show forgiveness? And how can I, you know, yeah, it, forgiveness in marriage. It's, it's an essential component of marriage. Ruth Bell Graham said it best, I think. I, it, uh, marriage is the union of two forgivers. You forgive and forgive again and forgive again after that. It, it's just the same spirit that works in you is working in your spouse, your husband, your wife. The same spirit that works in you. How many of us need forgiveness? We called on upon the Lord for forgiveness and he has granted us forgiveness if you confess your sins. He'll be faithful and just to forgive us of all our unrighteousness. God's way of orienting our hearts towards others, whether they deserve it or not, is forgiveness. Whether we're loved or hated, the Bible calls us to show kindness to strangers, to friends, to family members, to people of faith and even people who are not of the faith. Kindness is closely linked to forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4.32 says this, and be kind to one another, right? Tenderhearted, and what does he say here? Forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. I think it's important for us to understand this morning that, it's, that we can't be dulled to the power of kindness. He speaks about goodness now. For the word of the Lord is right and his work is done in truth and he loves righteousness and justice and the earth is full of goodness of the Lord. Hezekiah and Josiah are prime examples. They rid Israel of all the worship and the idols and they were, they were prime examples of leaning upon the goodness of the Lord and goodness is simply that, obeying the Lord and standing on the side of righteousness, standing on the side of goodness. We need a supernatural strength sometimes to do that because the world and everything that it offers, it's trying to steer us away from doing just that, from standing on the side of righteousness. He speaks about faithfulness and gentleness. This word gentleness has the idea of being teachable, not having a superior attitude but, or demanding your own rights. It speaks about being teachable. I think that's an important aspect of even those in leadership. That, that we don't have people in leadership, not even myself, who say, I know it all. I don't know it all. I learn from my staff. I learn from you. I learn from your life. I'm inspired by you as a church. I'm inspired that you come every Sunday to let your faith be made known, and you sit in your cars and say, I'm going to worship Jesus. I don't care who tells me not to worship. I'm going to worship. And you come here, and you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. That inspires me. It's a blessing, and I consider it a great honor to be your pastor. But I'm teachable, and I learn from you. He speaks about self-control. Now imagine a small child throwing a tantrum. I know it's not, not foreign to many of us right now. They could throw toys. They could shriek when they don't get what they want. And now fast forward 20 years in the workforce, this version of, of his or her future self, one without self-control is yelling at the face of her soon-to-be former employer. You know, making, making her 
uh, write a report or rewrite a report or, or do something at work that they feel that they've done already in, in, in the way that they saw fit, but they're telling, being told to do it again, and, and they're, they're protesting. And, you know, there's a different version. One was self-control, which would take the criticism from a, a boss and comply without hesitation. And, and there's an example of maybe self-control, a secular type of self-control, the, or the need for self-control, which is, which is exactly what, what's it, what it sounds like, control over self, right? But for Christians, self-control is not merely about temperament. It's about resisting the temptation to break God's law. That's what it's about. Resisting the temptation to break God's law. Resisting the temptation to be disobedient. Bringing every thought of the captivity of Jesus Christ, the obedience of Christ, that's how it's done. That self-control, that godly self-control is our thoughts and our actions, including, you know, that, 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 that mentality, bringing things into the, the captivity and the obedience of Christ. Now, let's finish it up. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Our character, that fruit, will be tested by our relationships. By our relationships. By the people that we live with. By the people that we work with. That fruit will be tested by those relationships. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. What does the cross remind you of? You think about it. It reminds me that we're called to take up our cross and follow him. Remember that in Matthew chapter 16? It reminds me that, that, that Jesus Christ dealt with the flesh And he's calling us to deal with the flesh. And sometimes dealing with the flesh is painful. It's painful. It reminds us that our flesh must be dealt with decisively. But Christ is the life and the vine of all fruit. And I think Paul the Apostle said it best in this way. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, so it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live for the one who loved me and gave himself for me in Galatians 2.20. I think that's the epitome of being crucified. And he says, I could do everything through him who, him who gives me strength. I want to finish with this. There's so much in these verses, man. It's just incredible. We could do a a single Bible study on each of those words. But imagine you were holding a cup of coffee this morning and I was holding a cup of coffee the other day and my son bumped me and, and I got coffee on my shirt and on my shorts. And uh, you think about it, you're bumped, if somebody bumps into my cup of coffee, what's going to come out of that cup? Coffee. If someone bumps into you with that cup of coffee, it's going to spill. You didn't spill tea. I thought to myself, I didn't spill grape juice or soda. I spilled coffee because coffee is what was in the cup. If I had tea in my cup, tea would have spilled out. But the point is, whatever's inside your cup is what will spill out of your cup if bumped or shaken. Now, we, you and I, are all vessels. Not unlike a cup. Looking from the outside, no one can know what we contain. Just by looking at you, no one can know what you contain. But when events of life bump up against you, shake you, whatever is inside of you will likely spill out. It's often said, character is proven through circumstances. 
So I think it's important that we ask ourselves this morning, what's in my cup? Is it love, joy, peace, gentleness, self-control? Or is it anger, bitterness, anxiety, impatience, mean-spiritedness, ill will, faithlessness, harshness, a lack of discipline? I think it's important for us to understand we might present to the world that we are full of one thing when we really are full of another. It's easy to fake it when nothing is bumping into us, to fake our Christianity, to fake a faithful life when nothing is shaking us up. But bring on a little trial a little temptation, a little irritation, conflict, inconvenience, etc. And what's inside of our heart of hearts will come spilling out. So my encouragement to you this morning, fill yourselves with the fruits of the Spirit so that the goodness and light within you spills out onto others as a testimony of the transforming power of Jesus Christ in your life. Allow his life to spill out to others. And you know what? We're living in a day where there's plenty to bump into us and plenty of people will be able to see what truly lies within us and whether we are a man or a woman of faith. Incredible. These fruits are the mark of a Christian life. But a tree that bear good, bears good f- fruit, it's located near a good water source, a, new, a good food source. And the same is similar for you as a Christian. If you're in close proximity to a good food source, a nourishing source like the Word of God, prayer, you worship, what is going to spill forth? What is going to come forth? Fruit. And do you have to try to bring about that fruit? No, it's something that comes naturally. Naturally. The natural part of the fruit tree bearing fruit is its proximity to a good, nourishing food source. And the same principle applies to you spiritually. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. And we just pray right now, If there's anybody that doesn't know you, I pray, Lord, that they would call upon you. Wherever you're at right now, sitting in your car or maybe on Facebook, there's an opportunity for you to call upon the Lord and ask him into your heart to experience his forgiveness, his peace, his transforming power in your life. And it'll be evidence in your very life that it's transformed. If you want to receive Christ this morning into your heart, if you want to establish a relationship with the Lord, it's not about religion. It's not about a religious establishment. It's about a relationship with the Lord. That is what the Bible speaks about. It's all about what he's done for you. If we could add anything to the cross, a good work, repetitive prayers, praying to somebody, you know, penance, If we could add anything to the cross, then the Bible says Jesus Christ died in vain. The fact of the matter is is that he accomplished everything and fulfilled everything on the cross. So if you want to ask him into your heart right now, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. Dear Jesus, repeat after me. Dear Jesus, please forgive me because I know I'm a sinner. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me and dying for me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible says if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that he tosses your sins as far as the east and the west and remembers them no more. It doesn't mean that God has amnesia. It just means that he doesn't put those sins to your account anymore. You are transformed. You're a new creature in Christ, the Bible says. If you ask Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, please post here and let us know. And We want to send you a Bible and the things that you need to grow in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We pray for all those that are in need physically this morning. We pray for Deandra's mom, bring healing to her life. 
We pray, Lord, for baby Josiah. Continue to have your hand upon his life, Lord. We pray for healing, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for um, the Wisners, Lord God, and just the impact that they've made upon our church. We pray for Christina and her family right now that they would have your peace in the passing of her grandfather, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord, that you bring peace to the family. We thank you so much, Lord, for all that you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this venue to be able to to minister and to be ministered to. Continue, Lord, just to use Calvary Chapel Eastvale. We thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Love you so much. See you next week. All right, let's worship. Have a good week.